Bonsoir, euh, bienvenue au Centre francophone de l'Université de Novi Sad. Mon nom est Pablo Sekerouch et je suis directeur de ce centre. Uh, I know that we decided to speak in English, so I will do my best to, to speak in English to you, those few words. We are happy today to have this round table with illustrious guests uh, like Mr. Jean-Paul Bled, uh, Professor Emerit de l'Université Paris-Sorbonne, Professor Ginter Kronenbitter from the University of Augsburg, and Professor Luciano Monzali from the University of Bari. Uh, you saw your invitation. The subject of our roundtable will be the end of a great war. And Navisat will especially dedicate this, one, this roundtable to the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Our colleague from the Department of History, Mr. Branko Beshin, will be, will be a host for our professors, and so I will give him the microphone <laughs> and the word, and he will speak a little bit more about the subject of today's roundtable. Thank you very much. Before, uh, before I give a word uh, to our lecturers, I want to say something about, uh, to first to introduce them to you, and uh, to give one short uh, word about importance of this lecture. Uh, I wanted to say a few introductory words. I will not take up too much of your time, but I think it's better if I spoke in Serbian, because I will be speaking about the importance of this lecture for all of us here, especially the Serbian audiences uh, and my colleagues who gathered here today. Right at the beginning, I'd like to say that the First World War has brought momentous changes to the world and the immediate consequences were felt by that first generation. Uh, but uh, as all other wars, it never solved all the problems, but rather caused more problems. The generation that took part in the First World War and the next generation after that uh, only had another world war to look forward to. In this world war, all the great forces took part, which battled in the First World War as well, except for one, which is Austria-Hungary. That one had disappeared. All the others had had their um, heirs, the Soviet Union, uh, the Third Reich in Germany, but, but Austria-Hungary had disappeared off the map, and that is our topic today. Why is Austria-Hungary particularly important for the, this part of the world? Well, it is because from year to year, obviously, we mark a anniversary, a jubilee linked to the First World War. But in um, 2018, it will be 100 since the uh, the time that Vojvodina became part of Serbia. In Serbia, it will be marked by a number of events, both scientific as well as those will have some sort of a more popular character. I'm sure that all these events will shed some light of the um, merging of Vojvodina with Serbia, and uh, I think what we will hear from our guests today will be an enormous contribution to better knowledge, a wider, more in-depth knowledge of 1918, and uh, our guests today will be talking about the breakup of Austria-Hungary. Uh, next to me uh, is Professor Jean-Paul Bled. Uh, very well known here in Serbia because uh, most of his um, work has been translated into Serbian. He started his very rich career, his scientific career at a very early age in 1966 and until 69 with 20 
He was about 24 years old. He started teaching and then 69 in Metz, then in Nantes until 72 and then for 23 years at the Institute for Political Science in Strasbourg. Professor Bled, I see there are a number of historians here in the audience, but it's important to mention because of our younger colleagues, Professor Bled is one of the most important historians uh, of the German-speaking world, including Germany and Austria especially. He is also the editor of a journal, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, the last edition uh, is concerned with the so-called Danube studies. Oh, obviously, he's uh, published a number of important articles, but also books, the biography of Franz Josef, and uh, many other ca um, ca characters from the Habsburg monarchy, uh, Maria Theresa, Franz Josef, and Maria Theresa and the one that appeared last year that Serbian audiences still haven't had a chance to see um, even in the original, let alone in translation, is about Empress Sophia, the mother of Franz Ferdinand. Then there are uh, books on the his German history, the biography of Friedrich the Great translated. I'm sorry, uh, Bismarck biography um, translated into Serbian. There's a, a biography of Queen Louisa and then Hitler's men. The last book which we hope to see in Serbian translation is The Agony of Austria-Hungary, which is particularly concerned with our topic today. A moment ago, I asked Professor Bled, with his permission, if I could say a few words about his in, um, involvement in public life. Professor Bled is not one of the uh, historians who shy from uh, the public eye, but he's not involved in politics. He is one of the members of the De Gaulle movement in France. Uh, a lot of his activities are concerned with this mo movement, uh, but if Professor Bled is interested and has time, perhaps one day he could talk to us about that, although that is not our topic today. He has also worked and published in the Figaro, and he has received a number of awards for his work, the uh, Légion d'honneur, uh, as well. Uh, but, and he is also a, um, a member of the Serbian Academy of Arts and Sciences. Then on my other side, uh, we have uh, Professor Ginter Kronenbitter from, as you've heard, the University of Augsburg. He has uh, a degree in political science, but he, besides Augsburg, where he teaches European ethnology, he's particularly interested in the history of ideas, a book which you could be interested in um, impossible to find in Serbian translation, I'm afraid, is about the military leadership of Austria-Hungary in world politics from 1906 until 1914. Um, and our guest has a vast experience in this field. He also, besides teaching at the University of Augsburg, he has also taught in, at universities in Vienna, Salzburg, Diplomatic Academy at the universities in America, uh, such as Columbia and Atlanta. Our third guest is Lunciano Monzali from the University of Bari, uh, University Aldo Moro. He got his degree from the University of Bologna and then a PhD at the University of Sapienza in Rome. And he's currently teaching a history of international relations, uh, if I'm not mistaken, University of Political Science. 
uh, in Bari, in Italy. You might particularly be interested in one segment of his in interest, particularly interesting for us here in Serbia, which is fairly neglected here, which is the history of Italians in Dalmatia. And uh, he has dedicated a lot of his attention to this bit of history. In uh, former Yugoslavia, it was a part of uh, political life in um, in Dalmatia, however, that is not the case anymore. He was a co-editor in uh, Nova Revista Historica, and if I am not mistaken, uh, quite a lot of this data was available on the internet. That's the only source I had, which is the history of his historiography. So one of his interests. So that's all I wanted to say, meaning that we've got very interesting guests here, and I'm sure we'll hear very interesting things. This will not be a lecture as such, but a kind of panel. And I would like to give the floor to Professor Jean-Paul Bled. Thank you. Thank you very much for everything you said about me. <laughs> Uh, well, at the eve of uh, the First World War, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy is one of the big powers in Europe. But it's a power in decline. This decline started uh, let's say, in uh, 1866, uh, at the Battle of, in German, let's say, Königgrätz, in French we say Sadova, but it's the same battle. And this battle, is very important because um, it concluded the rivalry between Austria and Prussia. And after this battle and the peace which came afterwards, um, Austria was expelled from Germany. Germany made its unity after this war and after some years later the uh, Prussian-German uh, French war. And Austria didn't take part to this uh, German unity. So it was expelled from Germany. And this same year uh, saw an, another event. Austria was definitely expelled from Italy. Of course, uh, Austria kept some pieces, little pieces, but uh, generally speaking, uh, Austria was expelled, it lost Venetia, it was the uh, last big uh, part of um, the Austrian prisons in Italy. After these events, Austria had also to know an internal transformation. This internal transformation is the compromise, the Ausgleich, between Austria and Hungary. It was the following year, so uh, 67. And after 
Austria became Austria-Hungary. After these defeats, Austria-Hungary had to try to keep his status of great power, which explained that Vienna tried to expand in southeastern part of Europe. It was first the occupation and later on uh, the annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. But you can see this decline in the fact that Austria-Hungary had to make an alliance with Germany, the very uh, state which expels, expelled uh, Austria some years before. It was a consequence of this uh, move to southeastern Europe, where Vienna uh, would meet with the Russian uh, power and to get the protection from Russia, Vienna had to uh, conclude this alliance with uh, the Bismarckian Germany. And in some way, it's uh, a proof of decline. Then Austria-Hungary is in the Europe at this time an anachronical uh, state. It's a multinational state. And, of course, in the Europe of this time, it's in some way a uh, unicum. Of course, some countries, some other uh, big countries, Germany, uh, Russia, have minorities. But it's not absolutely the same as in uh, uh, Austria, Hungary, in Germany, you have the Germans and some minorities, uh, the Poles, uh, the Alsatian <coughs> and um, uh, Lothringer. Um, in Russia, there are also minorities, but the core, the real core, is the Russian people. Here, the German uh, represent just a bit more than 20% of the pop all population. So you see that's quite different. And Austria-Hungary uh, contains more than 10 national big nationalities. I don't count the little, little ones. And in this time where the national state prevails, of course, it's something uh, special. And it is interpreted by many people as a sign of weakness. And it is true that um, uh, Austria-Hungary has much difficulty to solve this problem of nationalities. I have to say that the situation is a bit, and maybe more than a bit, different in Austria and Hungary. The treatment 
of the nationalities in Austria is much more liberal than it is in Hungary. Um, Franz Josef and Franz Ferdinand are aware of this weakness or these weaknesses. But they don't come to the same conclusion. For Franz Josef, the solution is to uh, not to change anything to the dualism. This dualism, which is the new uh, organization of the monarchy. Franz Ferdinand uh, came to a total different conclusion. He realized that dualism was a weakness and that um, it could be a threat to uh, the monarchy. We don't know exactly what he wanted to do because his ideas have changed along the years. But one thing is absolutely sure, he wanted to create a new relation with Hungary, with the Hungarian uh, political elite. And you have, for instance, an example of that. He never accepted to meet with the Hungarian prime minister. And in the time of Titsa, well, he never met uh, Titsa, which was an indication that he would uh, make something. Of course, we'll never know what uh, he would have done as he was killed, as everybody knows, in Sarajevo. Uh, the 28th of June, uh, <coughs> 14. So, some weaknesses. But is it sufficient to conclude, as some did, that the monarchy was doomed to death. Well, in my view, it's personal view, uh, the monarchy was not doomed to death. It had still potential strengths. And one there are many, but one is very important. It's uh, the dynastic patriotism in the monarchy. There is, of course, no national uh, Austrian identity. It was not possible as Austria was a multinational uh, state. But there was a, a dynastic patriotism around uh, the figure of Franz Josef. And you have the proof of that at the very beginning of the war. Some have thought that uh, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy would fall apart 
at the very beginning of the war. It doesn't happen. On the contrary, there is among the people, among the folker of this monarchy, what we call in French, Union Sacrée. And Franz Josef writes a manifest, and meine Volker, to my people. And the Volker uh, answer to this manifest. And one year later, uh, it is in May 15, it's a time when uh, Italy declares a war to Austria-Hungary, and in that time, you have once again a, a surge of uh, uh, Austrian patriotism. You feel that in Tyrol, among this population which has a long story of <coughs> uh, feuds with uh, Italians, and this feeling you can see it also among the Croatians. There is also a surge among the Croatians, a surge of dynastic patriotism uh, as one year before. So, I will stop now because if I uh, well, we understood, if I well understood, we'll carry on with this topic later. But uh, I'll come back, of course, and explain why <coughs> the monarchy uh, disappeared three years later. Thank you. Uh, to Professor Blade, and I give a word to Professor Bita. OK, so thank you. Um, I will also, of course, deal with this question of whether the Habsburg monarchy was doomed or not. We agreed on doing this. Um, but of course, to make it a little bit more lively, I probably will try to well, come up with some alternative interpretations for the sake of debate. So basically, I, I agree with you, but I don't like to agree with you in this situation, <laughs> because otherwise there would be no debate at all. So let's start with uh, recent historiography on the Habsburg monarchy. Perhaps some of you know the book written by Peter uh, uh, Judson. Um, you know him? Yeah, and his work. Um, it's a very good summary of recent scholarship on the Habsburg monarchy, of course, with an extra twist. Uh, but what is typical for him and others who basically came up with ideas he then integrated in his survey book. Um, what was important to them was to stress that the Habsburg monarchy was quite dynamic. It wasn't doomed at all. It was much more flexible as a political system. And it was capable of basically offering platforms to negotiate, you might say, preferences fears and aspirations among different social groups and different national groups. It was, you might say, like a marketplace in a way where people could <coughs> trade ideas and look for new alliances. And what Peter Judson, of course, added to this kind of a debate was that even the imperial bureaucracy, the central bureaucracy of the Habsburg monarchy, the Austrian one and the Hungarian one to a certain degree as well, had a fruitful role to play in this because local groups had a chance to basically raise their voice, make their voices heard against traditional local elites who, before that, 
before the late 19th century in particular, tended to control the political landscape in the different regions and parts of the Habsburg monarchy. So what is important here, it's a dynamic situation. And if you read Judson's book, then there is a passage on whether or not the Habsburg monarchy was doomed. And he then says, well, this traditional perception among many historians is based more or less on a very specific corpus of sources. Letters, diaries, memoranda written by the traditional power elite, the military leadership, the diplomatic leadership, some politicians, they actually were afraid that their traditional supremacy, their dominance, would sooner or later be eroded in this dynamic development inside of this Habsburg monarchy. So he dismissed this as basically non-important comment. They didn't get it. That was his interpretation. These old elites just didn't get it. But this now, I think, is going a little bit too far because these traditional elites really mattered. And their view of what was going on, whether the Habsburg monarchy was more or less doomed or not, it mattered. It mattered in 1914. It was the, you might say, most important idea. It was a nightmare, you might say, on the mind of decision makers in Habsburg power elite circles in the years before 1914 and also during the July crisis. So it was an historical fact. It was, you might say, something that had agency in the historical process, although perhaps historians today have a different judgment, a more benign judgment on the possibility of developing the Habsburg monarchy into something new, more modern perhaps, and even more flexible. But foreign policy, was crucial to these power elites. They could not imagine, they couldn't envision a Habsburg monarchy not being a great power. And this is something Professor Blade already explained to us so uh, perfectly well. This is a crucial and at the same time a very difficult precondition for Habsburg policy in general. If you go back to, let's say, the early 19th century, this is, you might say, the, sort of the best days of the Habsburg monarchy. After the Congress of Vienna, the Habsburg monarchy looked so stable and uh, quite influential in European politics. But if you look a little closer, then you would actually detect the first signs that something is wrong. This Habsburg monarchy could never ever come up with the resources, in particular the financial resources, necessary to be a first rank great power on its own. It always needed support. It always depended on alliances and coalitions. It always needed basically kind of a tacit consensus among the other great powers that it is a useful part of European order. And over the course of the 19th century, and in particular at the beginning of the 20th century, something changed in this regard. Paul W. Schröder, I think, was one of the historians who really made clear how serious this change affected the position of the Habsburg monarchy in international relations. In particular, Britain started to lose interest in the very existence of the Habsburg monarchy, and so did, up to a point, of course, also France. Not to ask the Italians, well, it's a different thing. You will talk about this later. So um, in general, you might say there was certainly a negative trend with regard to the future of the Habsburg monarchy as a great power. There is no denying of this. Well, then the Austro-Hungarian leadership decided in 1914 to trigger war. They knew pretty well that this would become a European war quite easily, so you can really say they started the Great War. So if you take Judson's perspective, and many historians do, then you would say this was a great mistake. They should never ever have entered this kind of a war, or even triggered this kind of a war. Well, 
Now we come to the iffy questions. Of course, what we are doing now is like contrafactual history. If you're talking about was it doomed or not, of course, it's no longer around. It's, it's counterfactual history. So I know we have to be careful about this. I mean, had Alexander the Great lived for another 20 years, we would probably live in a different world. We would be gurus, and the Indian culture probably would have prevailed all over the globe under his rule. Anyway, so. Um, if you think about possibilities of survival for the Habsburg monarchy, not just as a junior partner of Germany, or just as more or less a diminished factor in European politics after a victory of the Entente. So if you really think about, was there any possibility that the Habsburg monarchy could have survived as a great power, which of course was the reason in the first place why they started the war, then the answer, to my opinion, is no. Of course, you mentioned quite correctly that there was a lot of loyalty and support among the population for this Habsburg monarchy. The military leaders of the Austro-Hungarian army had always said, we have to start war pretty soon, because if we wait any longer, nationalities would probably no longer be under control. And then if you give orders for war, probably at least the Slavs wouldn't really be willing to fight. But it didn't happen. That's what you pointed out, and that's a very important point, certainly. But if you look at Turkey, or even Russia, you would find the same thing. The First World War, to a certain degree, made it possible for societies to find a new kind of basis for coherence. Collective effort, collective suffering, you might say, it changed societies everywhere. So it's not so, it's not so exceptional, and it's not so, you might say, um, uh, proof that the Habsburg monarchy had a specific, specific, you might say, ideological backbone, others perhaps lacking. But I mean, if you look at the Entente policy up to the summer of 1918, there were no real plans to split up the Habsburg monarchy completely. It happened only in the last couple of months of the war. That is true. But now the iffy part. If you imagine the Habsburg armies and the German armies would have prevailed in the very end, you can be absolutely sure, if you look at the record of coalition warfare and German-Austrian relations throughout the war, that Austria would have ended up as really a junior partner of an overwhelmingly mighty Germany dominating the European continent. If you look at the records of German um, officers serving with Austrian forces on the Eastern Front, you can sometimes find in their report they filed, uh, remarks that, well, the Austrians are not fighting really well. They are so sloppy. There's no discipline. They're not aggressive enough. They're not well organized enough. The officer corps is spoiled and effeminate. So quite different from us, that was the, um, the general assumption. And then the conclusion was, well, but if you look at the Bavarians, think of 1866, and now they are quite proper soldiers. So they really envisioned already a future where Germany would be the dominating partner, really dominating in a, in a way that wasn't conceivable up to 1914, because, for example, the Habsburg leadership was, of course, still thinking in ideas of sovereignty. But now, all of a sudden, on the horizon, you could see something like, well, let's say NATO. So it is a kind of an alliance of unequals. Um, so there has to be one dominating partner, and the other one would have to follow. And of course, if the allied powers um, won and not had pursued a policy of uh, dismemberment of the Habsburg monarchy, you can be pretty sure that the very basis of internal integrity, stability, and cohesion would have been gone. So probably it would have been just a matter of time for the Habsburg monarchy to fall apart anyway. So that's the point I want to make, just for the sake of a debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I think uh, 
what I would like to say, first of all, is why it's still so interesting to study the history of the Habsburg Empire. Um, I studied for some years Austrian and Habsburg history because I, I was interested in the history of the Austrian Dalmatia and the history of the Italian minority. And what attracted me then, uh, we are talking about 20 years ago, and it's still attracting me, is the fact that studying the history of the Habsburg Empire it's a very useful exercise to reflect on a very peculiar and important political experiment that was the existence of a European multinational state. A state that tried for centuries to let different nationalities and peoples with different religions, different languages, different cultures to live together. And nowadays, this problem, this Defi en français, it is still more and more interesting to study, especially to understand why it failed. Of course, we historians, we study the past, but very often what we study is connected with our hopes, with our ideas, with the, live, the life we are living, or the society in which are, we are living. And of course, studying Asbur Empire, you think, oh, now what you are thinking, some problem of the Asbur Empire are some problem of the European Union. So it's interesting to study Habsburg Empire because you face some of the problems that nowadays we are facing in Europe. So it's very fascinating, it's very useful, and I think it's very useful that European students and scholars still study this subject that I think is very interesting. So I agree with uh, my colleagues that are, are much better uh, scholars about the history of the Habsburg Empire. Uh, the Habsburg Empire was not doomed to disappear. If we analyze uh, his uh, political economic situation in the year before 1914, we can see that Austria-Hungary was knowing a good economic development. You have still traces of this. You go to Budapest, you see that what, what was Budapest? It was all, all this wealth that the Budapest before the First World War had. So Budapest, Vienna, Trieste, Thirst, uh, some parts of Bohemia. So the country was knowing a slow but constant economic development. It's also true that the political system had problems, but it was a dynamic political system, especially the Austrian part. It had the capability since 1859 to change and to evolve. So 1907, we have uh, in the Austrian part the universal suffrage. So it was more advanced than in Italy. So the political system was dynamic, was had the possibility to change as well. And in, within the empire, the uh, separatist forces were minority. If you study, I, I am an expert about the Italian uh, part of the empire, most of the Italian parties in the Habsburg Empire did not want the end of the empire. They want to stay inside the, the empire. So the uh, internal forces were not so strong to cause the demise of the empire. Also, the international situation of the Habsburg Empire was not so bad. It's true, it was a great power in decline, but the position, the geopolitical position and the position of the empire in, within the European system of power was quite good. It had the German protection. And not, not one of the great powers did really want the end of the empire. The most hostile power to the Habsburg Empire was probably Italy. But Italy wanted some Austrian territories, but didn't want the, the breakup of the Habsburg Empire. Why? Because also the Italians saw the Habsburg Empire as an important element of the maintenance of the European balance of power. What does it mean? It means that in the existence of Austria-Hungary helped political stability in Europe. Italy didn't want any hegemony in Europe. So it wanted a system that more or less there were five, six powers that had a more or less equivalent power and strength, military strength. So what could happen very negatively for in, in Italian eyes if the Habsburg Empire would break up? It would happen that uh, the breakup of Austria-Hungary Austria would benefit especially to Germany and to Russia. 
So, after all, that uh, Italian view was if Austria would give us uh, some territories at the borders that we need, and the Italians asked uh, a, a ratification of the borders based mainly on the nationality principle, for Italy it would have been perfect that the Habsburg Empire would still live and survive. The re, the, there was, of course, the Romanian redentism, there was the Serbian redentism, but Serbia and Romania were still very weak states, so they were, they were not a real political danger or military danger to Austria. So we can say the international position of Austria-Hungary Austria was not bad. So I agree with Blatt and uh, Cronenbitter that the origins of the demise of Austrian-Hungarian Empire, it's the ambition of the polit Austrian-Hungarian political class to remain a great power. So the origins of the demise of the breakdown is the decision to pursue a very aggressive and expansionist foreign policy. So to abandon a conservative, peaceful foreign policy and to start from, <coughs> we can say, some people say uh, 1908, some people say 1914, an aggressive foreign policy. And aggressive foreign policy that if you think about it in political, foreign, political uh, realism, it's still difficult to understand. It's diff still difficult to understand what were the perspective of attacking Serbia and to occupy Serbia. Would have brought a better international position to Austria? I do, do not think so. So it's really wrong foreign policy and a crisis of the political and military leadership inside the, the, the Asburg Empire. And here I think the main culprit is Franz Josef. Franz Josef is the person that decides to go to war against Serbia. And so I think some of its good reputation that still he has is unbeaten and undeserved. Thank you. Thank you. And I will dare to, to take advantage of my role of moderator and to add something. Uh, the question whether Austria was or not was doomed to disappear the uh, some reasons for confidence in ocean elite we could uh, find in the uh, history of previous two centuries first world war at the very beginning of war very few people uh, people could um, uh, know uh, that this war uh, will take uh, will be so destructive and we there were a few people who know uh, who predicted the war will be very long and that it will be war of material but it was not first time in Austrian history that his existence was endangered in previous two centuries in a war of during the Rakotsi uprising during the war of Austrian succession, during the Napoleonic, Na, Napoleonic Wars, during the uh, revolution of the 1848, uh, 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 the uh, existence of Austria was, uh, was endangered. And this empire, multinational empire and dynasty, uh, even in uh, dynasty, they uh, managed to survive. And why not to believe that Austria is capable to survive uh, regarding all difficulties, even in this war? Uh, in my opinion, it's worth it to discuss about it. Thank you. And I give the word. Thank you. So, uh, the problem is why uh, <clears throat> the monarchy died and in my view the main reason is that this war was too long for it of course the war was too long for everybody for every state but um, for Austria Hungary it is especially true. Um, 
very quickly uh, different crises uh, are developing. The first crisis is the food crisis. There are many reasons, I will not uh, explain them here, but this crisis um, hurts the civil population and hurts also the soldiers at the different fronts. And this crisis gets worse and worse along the years. It was never solved by uh, the authorities. And this leads to starvation, to famine, and um, this creates social tensions, of course, and the rifts which have existed before the war, these rifts reappear and become wider. And when I say that, I uh, think, of course, of the problem of the nationalities. So, this war, this war was too long. And that's what uh, Franz Josef, uh, just before he died, uh, understood. And, of course, that's also what his successor, Emperor Karl, Emperor Charles, uh, realized also. And he tried to get a solution. The solution was peace. And he tried to uh, uh, get this peace. He didn't succeed for different reasons. But as you probably know, uh, he received, it was in March um, 17, he received uh, two of um, his brothers-in-law, Prince Sixth and Xavier of uh, Parma, Bourbon de Parma. And he wrote a letter which was to be given to the President of the French Republic, uh, Raymond Poincaré. In this letter, he wrote that well, it was for the restoration of Belgium. It was for the restoration of Serbia with um, an access to the Adriatic Sea, which was, of course, something uh, extraordinary when we uh, remember that was the cause of the war. And then, he wrote that he recognized the legitimate aspiration on France, on France, on uh, Alsace and Lorraine. His idea was to uh, convince the Germans to accept, uh, to abandon Alsace and Lorraine, in compensation, Germany would have received uh, the Russian part of Poland and even Galicia. He hoped that uh, 
Germany would be attracted by this idea, but it was not. And what was um, what were the reactions of uh, France and United Kingdom? Because United Kingdom was also was interested by these proposals. Well, they were interested. And the reaction was, of Poincaré, was rather uh, positive. <clears throat> Lord George was not against it. But, there was a but. Both of them and uh, uh, the French Prime Minister um, uh, realized that they had to get the approval of Italy. And of course, Italy couldn't give this approval because in the letter, Charles didn't say anything about Italy. He didn't say anything because uh, on the incidents of front, well, there was a sort of statu quo, and he didn't think he had anything to give to the Italians. And of course, when this uh, proposal was presented uh, in uh, the conference of Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne some days later, uh, Sonino explained that it was not possible to accept uh, the powers, powers of Entente have signed a treaty, the Treaty of uh, Law of London, and this proposal ignored this treaty, so Italy couldn't give this approval. But uh, so it was, of course, uh, a big disappointment. But there is another fact that uh, Germany did not accept the idea of uh, abandoning uh, Alsace and Lorraine. And Charles didn't want to sign a separate uh, peace treaty. He had a sense of loyalty towards uh, his ally. And so this uh, attempt uh, failed completely. Of course, you have also to consider that what uh, Professor Colin Bitter explained, there was no more balance of power bet between the two allies. Uh, the relation was more and more unequal. Uh, Austria-Hungary needed the help of German troops on different fronts. And of course, this had uh, political consequences. And at the end, in, not at the end, but uh, it was in May uh, 18, Charles had to go to Canossa because this letter was uh, published in France. I will not explain why, um, but it was published. And of course, it was a terrible moment for Charles. He had two, poly two possibilities. One was theoretical, that was to try to have a new uh, connection with the uh, Anton powers, to 
negotiate a separate uh, treaty. But it was not powerful enough inside the monarchy to uh, try his attempt. The main forces, main political forces, were against this idea, the main parties. Maybe not the Social Democrats, but uh, Charles didn't want at that time uh, include them in in government, uh, so they didn't play uh, a part. The second uh, alternative, second option, was to uh, reaffirm the loyalty of Austria-Hungary Austria to Germany. And that's what Charles did. He went to Spa, and as I said, it was uh, a new Canossa. And it had consequences. Uh, till that time, so we are in May 18, till that time, the powers of the Entente, with the exception of Italy, but France, United Kingdom, uh, United States, uh, we are not already um, in favor of a dissolution of the monarchy. If you uh, look at the uh, 14 points of Wilson, he speak from autonomy of uh, people of uh, Austria-Hungary. He doesn't speak of independence. Of course, the problem would have been how to realize this autonomy. But anyway, autonomy is not independence. And uh, for uh, the French Foreign Office, for the British Foreign Office, it was still the old idea that Austria-Hungary was a factor of the European uh, order European stability. But after this reaffirmation of loyalty, well, all these uh, ideas disappeared, and France and United Kingdom and United States uh, recognized the national committees the Czech National Committee, the South Slav National Committee, Polish National Committee. And from that time, there was a um, last chance for Austria-Hungary Austria to survive. It would have been a German victory. But in case that Germany would have won. Well, as Professor Conan Bitter said, uh, Austria-Hungary would have been a junior partner, a new Bavaria. That's what uh, uh, the German uh, politician and German uh, um, military leadership uh, wanted. So, uh, any side you take the problem, the monarchy would have dis disappeared. Should I join? Yeah, I think that's a very important point. Um, why does the war take so long? 
And why is it impossible to get out of the war? So there's no exit strategy, basically. There is no peace treaty before the final defeat of the central powers. Um, I think it's basically two sides of one coin. It's about coalitions. Coalitions, wartime coalitions, made it possible that you could actually, in a way, survive severe setbacks as long as you have a strong partner that could help you out. This is the basic experience all over the globe, you might say. And same, of course, for Serbia. Coalition warfare is essential. It is the way to prolong the war. Now you have enormous resources at hand. At the same time, of course, it ties your hands when it comes to finding a way out of the trouble. Because you have to always to have a consensus with your coalition partners, and they every so often will find themselves in a different strategic situation than you do. So if Austria is in the doldrums, Germany still has hope. They are still hoping for final victory on the Western Front. So they have no interest, really, to sacrifice anything that's important to them. Of course, not others Lorraine, that's for sure. Um, I think the problem behind this is that the First World War has a very strong dynamic, you might say, a dynamic of building up military forces, transforming societies and transforming the ways political decisions are made. And that's perhaps the reason why it's different from the wars of the 18th century, where it was still, you might say, cabinet policy. So you could still change ways, you could still change track even during conflict, at least you could imagine to do so. But in the First World War, it's no longer that states have coalitions. Coalitions have states. The coalition, in particular the one between Austria, Hungary, and Germany, becomes a political factor in its own right. And of course, as mentioned, in 1918, um, Emperor Charles has to be afraid of public opinion in his own empire he could no longer trust than perhaps the Germans, which are an essential part of the elite, the military, political, and economic elite, even at that time of the war. He cannot really risk to alienate them by looking for a separate peace treaty or something like this. So all of a sudden, these alliances become a real factor in politics. And that's, this makes it much harder to get out of the war. So you might say, it's a democratic war, in some sense of the word. It started by old-fashioned aristocrats and autocrats, but it ends up as something that is much more democratic. Not in a, you might say, positive sense, but it's very inclusive. Each and everybody has to contribute to the war effort. Um, there will be enormous sacrifices made, unimaginable. Uh, levels of sacrifices will be swallowed by societies, actually, but it has a price tag on it. You cannot do the same kind of uh, political dealings you could do as a diplomat in the 18th century anymore. And this makes it much harder. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, with the entry into the world, the situation of Austria-Hungary became weaker and weaker. And we can say also at, at the level of the internal balance of power. For instance, it's true that once Austria starts the war, there is uh, in some parts, in some nationalities, a strong demonstration of uh, dynast dynastic patriotism. But in other population, other nationalities, instead, it becomes a process of uh, progressive disenchantment, uh, resentment toward the central, pa central state. We have also to remember that what, what becomes Austria-Hungary after July 1914 for many months, it becomes a military dictatorship. And the condition of life of some nationalities become very harsh for, it, for to the Italians, for instance. The Italian parties, as I told you, were the most part of it, uh, most of the Italian uh, subjects were favorable to remain part of the Habsburg Empire. But after the, the war becomes, uh, what do these people experience? 
Many Italians are deported once Italy comes to war, are deported from their towns of origin, their regions of origin, because they live on the border. And so uh, we can see that progressively, most of Italian uh, subjects of the Habsburg Empire, from loyal subjects, become irredentists or very favorable to a detachment from uh, Austria-Hungary. If you study the biography of Alcide de Gasperi, who was an Italian member of parliament, you see that Alcide de Gasperi was a Catholic, very loyal to the emperor, uh, to the empire, but little by little, as the war goes on, he becomes a strong supporter of a detachment of Trentino from the Habsburg Empire. And the same happens to the Yugoslav peoples, to the Croats and to the Serbs. The treatment that Austria reserves to the Serbian territory that is occupied from Austria-Hungary creates a strong resentment in many Serbs inside the Habsburg Empire. We do not have to forget that many politicians, Serb and Croat, that live inside the Habsburg Empire are deported, are arrested. So what we can see is that because of the war, the Sit internal situation of the empire, the balance between the different nationality changes, and if some uh, still are very faithful to the em emperor, others become more and more unrest, uh, rebel, rebel, uh, rebels, uh, we can say. Um, the other point is interesting to, to see is that uh, the length of the war, what does it show? It shows that uh, multinational states uh, have greater problems to manage to run long wars, much more problems than national states. National states during First World War demonstrate to be more resilient, more effective in managing a long war. And this, what is the lesson from this historical experience? Is that after all, multinational entities, the Habsburg Empire, like now the, the European Union, have great problems and difficulties to face to manage crisis. Multinational states can prosper, in, 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 easily prosper in a period, in period of stability, of prosperity, but when there are crises, political, economic crises, or wars, you see that they have much more difficulties to manage to face uh, these crises. Thank you. Now I want to ask public have somebody any questions or remarks no no remarks hmm. <laughs> uh, it's uh, professor ivan jordovic it's a uh, head of history department in novi sad Sorry, so in order to be heard in a cabin, I don't know. Is, is it? It's okay. I will oh, speak loud. But nobody used the headphones anyway. Yeah. You, you will need that. Uh, the headphones. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. You will okay. have no, you will ask in English. Okay. Yes, so, so, I have one question about <laughs> the, the, one. the loyalty. Yes. Yeah. from Cambridge. <laughs> uh, uh, about the loyalty to the... I mean, can't, can't we say that uh, one of the main reasons for this loyalty is also that the emperor ruled over his uh, subjects for almost 70 years? I mean, they don't know any other ruler in their lives. I mean, they were born with him, most of them died. He still ruled. So. Could that be the real reason for the loyalty to the dynasty, or at least one of the major factors? Well, uh, it's of course um, an explanation of this loyalty, but uh, you might have the other uh, possibility that uh, uh, Franz Josef would have been um, uh, hated by the by his people because he, his reign was so long and uh, there were crises and so on and 
um, it was popular um, despite of this crisis, despite of the defeats. There were many defeats in his reign, and I have to I have to say that it was not always popular. Uh, if you look, for instance, after the Austrian defeat in Italy in 59, is not popular at all. And there are people who think it would be Philae, uh, maybe a good idea if his um, brother, Maximilian, would uh, reign in his place. So he's not popular, but he will become, uh, let's say, it's difficult to say when uh, his popularity uh, starts, of course, but I suppose, let's say, from the 70s. And is um, also a symbol of stability. And that's very important. If you read um, the famous book of Stefan Zweig, uh, uh, Die Welt von Gestern, uh, The World of the, uh, Yesterday, uh, that's what he points out, the stability. It was a world of stability. And at the top of this world, there was uh, the sovereign. May I just uh, word? I want a uh, oh, short word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, among many Serb, uh, Franz Josef uh, were idealized as a kind of paternalistic figure, as an ideal ruler, even after the Second uh, First World War. But but uh, we uh, simply could not underestimate two factors. The Serbian national propaganda in Habsburg monarchy, who was very strong, especially here in Novi Sad. And second, it was the solution of military border. This sense of borders, uh, many Serbs live in military borders, that they have, uh, they are under the special treatment. The emperor is uh, their father, like uh, for Russian Cossacks, the uh, kids of the emperor. Uh, the um, the uh, reputation of monarchy and lo loyalty among the Serbs start to decline in the uh, last 20 years of 19th century and especially after uh, victories of Serbia in Balkan Wars. This strong Ser Serbia was, at last, Serbia was accused for strong propaganda in the eve, in the July crisis. And uh, 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 it's undisputable, the tense sense and evil nostalgia towards also Hungary exist after the First World War. My mother's father was a fan of Franz Josef, but it's not <laughs> reason. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly there are many things that are peculiar to the Habsburg monarchy, but if you look at the overall situation in Europe, you would see that there is a change in the role monarchs play around the, let's say, middle of the 19th century in other cases as well. Um, Eric Hobsbawm was interested in all these things with regard to Great Britain, for example. Uh, if you can read German, uh, there's a book that can be recommended by Johannes Paulmann um, on this new kind of a role monarchs would take over in, in the 19th century. It's the beginning of mass media. It's a change of the role of the public and politics in general. And now these monarchs tend to fill a certain niche, an important you know, role, you might say. They have an important role in um, the way political unity is symbolized. And this brings me, I think, to your remark. You can actually imagine, let's say, Germany without the Hohenzollern. 
perhaps you could even imagine a Russia without the Romanovs. But you can certainly not imagine a Habsburg monarchy without the Habsburgs. And everything else, all these ideas about a Switzerland uh, in written large, basically, that were so popular among some nostalgic feeling ex-Austrians or ex-Austro-Hungarians, um, they were pipe dreams. It was just not possible to have something like this right in the middle of Europe in a highly contested field of power rivalry. So without the Habsburgs, no Habsburg monarchy. And all the faults these people had, let's say Franz Joseph, he wasn't perfect at all, and um, people were used to have him as an emperor, yes, but some didn't like him at the beginning and some even not at the end. Franz Ferdinand, he was a very peculiar person, certainly. And um, the same is true, I think, with regard to Emperor Charles. Now he's a saint, so oh no, he's on his way to become a saint, let's put it this way. Um, so we shouldn't talk badly about him. But, um, I mean, these these personalities really mattered in some way, in a way which perhaps wouldn't apply to the same degree, let's say, to Germany or perhaps even to Russia. It made the Habsburg monarchy vulnerable. There was a deficit of, you might say, unifying ideological resources when the system is under stress, be it a political crisis, a severe economic crisis, or, of course, a war, a great war. A prolonged great war. So you need some kind of a way to mobilize people. And in this period of the second mobilization, as some historians call it, in the First World War, this exactly is where the Habsburg monarchy cannot really actually follow the others. Even Italy manages, after Caporetto, to pull itself together. It's not really imaginable for the Habsburg monarchy anymore in the last two years of the war. There is this kind of a lack of unifying ideology. And probably you're right. So if you have a very complex political system, stay away from war. Is that OK? Is that a good conclusion? <laughs> but another thing that I think uh, we can think about it is that the other element of unity in, in the Habsburg Empire was the army, the imperial army. And of course, when you go to war, the war is very long and difficult, and the army starts to have problems, to lose unity and strength. This had a strong impact uh, on the crisis of, of consensus within the empire. Let's think only about the Serbs of the Habsburg Empire. Many Serbs were military men. Do not forget that this, the general that in Italy led in 1918 the Austrian armies, Borovic, was Serb. So imagine what the impact of the Austrian-Hungarian army crisis had on the loyalty of part of the Serbs of Austria-Hungary. So these also the war had also this negative effect. Not only weaken the dynasty patriotism, little by little, but also weaken what was the most important institution to unify, besides the loyalty to the dynasty, to unify the empire, especially in the South Slav areas, it was the army and the, the uh, prestige and the strength of the army. I only want to add that uh, concerning the dynastic loyalty. In, in fact, uh, there are uh, elements of corrosion of this dynastic loyalty even before the First World War. It, for instance, in the case of the Romanians in Transylvania, uh, it was a long tradition to see the Habsburgs as a sort of shield against the Hungarian uh, domination, against the Hung Hungarian elites. It was especially true in the context of 1848-1849. And, uh, and uh, I think the moment when Romanian, Romanians in Transylvania, Romanian elites, intellectual, religious, politics, the political, were closest to the dynasty was after 1849, in the context where the autonomy of Transylvania was restored and where, for the first time, Romanians participated briefly uh, before the, the outbreak to 
the political life of Transylvania as a legitimate partner. Mm -hmm. In fact, the dualism was a first proof that in, for Romania that they cannot count on, uh, on, on, uh, on the Habsburg for a perennization of their uh, political ascension in Transylvania. After that, the second moment was the memorandum movement at the very end of uh, the uh, 19th century, where the national Romanian elite in Transylvania addressed a memorandum, a political memorandum, to Franz Josef. And Franz Josef sent them to Budapest, and Budapest sent them to Germany. So, in fact, it was the last moment when the, uh, the confidence of the Romanian mm -hmm. national elite in Transylvania was uh, uh, hardly, uh, say, uh, was was uh, was uh, uh, weakened mm -hmm. by the attitude of, of Franco. Mm -hmm. Disillusionment. They were, dis they were disillusioned. Yes, and yeah. well, and mm -hmm. it is true that the Romanian, our Republic, which was mm -hmm. the one which tried to influence Franz Ferdinand. Mm -hmm towards the reformation of the empire uh, through this book uh, of him, uh, which was uh, forbidden in Hungary, uh, the United States of the Greater Austria. And uh, this was a project which remained theoretical, but which uh, uh, was an undertaking, isolated undertaking of uh, uh, Romanian intellectuals to, uh, to, to try again to, to, to put the confidence in the Habsburg for a future reformation. But, we know what uh, was the end of the story. Mm. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Somebody else? Oh, maybe, Professor Sekulus. Yeah, maybe something that will bring this discussion further, move it a little bit from the topic of tonight. I was very much seduced with an idea and uh, the comparison of the austro hungarian Empire and European Union, multinational. <coughs> big multinational composition on one side mm. and here two lack of unifying ideology uh, it's heavy ulterior what has european union to learn from the fall of post of hungarian empire <laughs> I think that you can also, yes. so I can yeah, you tell it has been very interesting what you have said uh, because I think that one of the roots of the decadence of the empire, absolute empire, and not only the absolute empire, is the lack of realism. It means the leadership of absolute, absolute empire didn't give an answer to this question. Do we have the means to run this kind of policy, aggressive policy. This is, a, I think, a typical problem of the 20th century, uh, many 20th century states. I think about the Italy of Mussolini. When he started to make an aggressive policy, he didn't pose the question to himself, do I have the means to make this kind of policy. And I think that this is the problem of the European Union. Do we have the intellectual, economical means to make uh, such a policy that we want to do? This is the question for me. You want to join in? No, please. You know. Me? Okay. <laughs> well, if I, I give, I give if, the comparison, you have to answer to it. That's true. If I look at this sticker here on the phone, on the mic, it says, with the support of Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. <laughs> um, that's not real an answer, I know. Um, I mean, certainly the European Union in the past two or three decades relied on financial means in many ways. And as soon as financial means are beginning to dry up and you have a financial crisis and the crisis of currency and so on, 
you really have a problem, that's for sure. Um, can the European Union learn something about how to proceed, or rather not to proceed, from the fate of the Habsburg monarchy? Well, I gave already one answer, I think. Uh, uh, you should probably uh, try to steer clear from an aggressive foreign policy. Of course, if you look at the history of successful nation states and empires, the opposite probably is true. You need foes and you have to fight them. And this is what unites people. So, um, but the European Union probably really doesn't have what it takes to do this. Neither the ideology, the coherence, nor the means really to implement such a policy. So probably it's better then to keep a low profile and do what you can do um, and um, focus on what you're good at. And of course, it's the European Union has been good at um, basically supporting economic development, sometimes buying, you might say, adversaries off so you give them some money and they will behave in a way that is acceptable. Um, so this is something they can achieve. They prove that they can achieve it and they probably will be capable of doing so even in the future. But of course, with the Brits gone, it will become a little bit more difficult. We might wage a, a war against Great Britain. That might be a very nice unifying thing for us. What would you say? <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. So if you want to learn from history, don't mess with the Brits, so that's true. So, so probably it's really uh, be realistic, avoid major conflicts and, conflicts, and also, of course, accept that Europe in a global context, all of Europe, all the peoples of Europe and the states of Europe together, be they members of the EU or not, we are in decline, relatively speaking. And there's no doubt about this. Europe is slowly but steadily coming back to its place in the global order of things that it had rightfully up to the, let's say, 18th century. So we are not absolutely unimportant, and life can be quite good, and we should enjoy it as long as it lasts. And we should accept that Europe cannot be on par with China, probably in the future, India, and certainly not the United States of America. And personally, I don't have a problem with this, because you have to be realistic. And we don't actually want to invest so heavily in, let's say, for example, the military. I spent some time in the US during the war in Iraq, and I lived in Atlanta, as you mentioned, and the airport, Atlanta Hartsfield, is a very busy one. And whenever I had to take a flight back to Europe, there were all these reserve troops, well, hanging around the airport, most of them moms and dads in their, let's say, 30s. And it was their third or fourth tour, and they really looked very, very depressed and sad. Do we really want to have something like this? I don't think so, actually. I, we probably don't have the guts for it, and I'm, I think um, it's good that we don't. So that's my answer. Well, um, I, I don't think that um, the real European leaders will learn something from the Habsburg monarchy, because not all of them, but most of them have no historical background. Uh, that's the uh, first reason, and a quite important one, in my view, anyway. Um, well, I would say also that um, there is no uh, European, European patriotism. And if you have no European uh, patriotism, it's very difficult to build a European state because it's a condition. And um, you spoke of the crisis and 
it's absolutely true. If you have a look at the uh, Iraq crisis, so of course it's uh, some years uh, ago, but it was very instructive. You had two important uh, states in Europe were uh, totally against uh, the American policy, so it was France and Germany, some others, but most of them, most of the states of the uh, European Union, didn't support this uh, policy. So we had a split inside the European Union. And I'm pretty sure that if we had tomorrow a new crisis of this uh, importance, you observe the same divisions, the same splits among the members of the European Union. Third, I observe, not with pleasure, but I observe that um, the European Union is today uh, internally divided. You have a sort of block uh, in the in Central Europe with the Visegrad group and probably um, Austria uh, is near this group now. Of course, there is a policy of the new Italian government. So it makes a block. And other countries don't agree for the time being. Maybe they will change, but anyway, for the time being, there is a strong division. And of course, it's um, um, it's a big obstacle to a European unity and a common European policy. So, for the time being, I would say it's a more beautiful dream than the reality. We started with Austro-Hungary and we came to a very pessimistic vision of European Can Union. Realistic, realistic, probably pessimistic. I think we do not have to make the mistake to think that uh, the political history, the political culture, the political historical experience of the Habsburg Empire is something that is forgotten or something very far away. In reality, uh, that experience uh, has lived uh, and has influenced very much uh, some parts of European history until today. Let's think only to the history of the two Yugoslavia. Let's think only about the importance that the Austrian-Hungarian experience and ideolo political model had for the Yugoslav communist leaders. Yes. Think only about it the way they, they, they thought about that experience and then try in a certain way to face and to find solution to those kind of problems that they thought they could come out again. I think all, all the problem of the borders. They decided to create a republic, a popular uh, social republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and they took the all the Austrian, Austrian-Hungarian border. So, and this is something so also the experience of Yugoslavia is very important to study, to understand. And if in a certain way, the, co the communist Yugoslavia experiment was a very sophisticated attempt to follow that uh, 
kind of political heritage and to find other uh, solution, a more sophisticated answer to those problems of a multi the survival of a multinational state. There were some similarities. Patriotic, uh, dynastic patriotism. What was the, in, in, in communist Yugoslavia? That there was the Tito patriotism. The last Habsburg. Uh, so Franz the Ozer was Habsburg. Tito. Habsburg. <laughs> the Imperial Army was the National Liberation Army. And what was new in the in communist Yugoslavia was that they invented this uh, common ideology, that was communism. But despite all this, also Yugoslavia came down. So which were which are the lessons perhaps from the Habsburg Empire and from the two Yugoslavia? Perhaps it's very important to preserve a balance of power among the different nationalities. What, for instance, is very dangerous now in Europe is this perception that there is one nation, one state, that is more powerful than the others. I don't think that's true. So in Italy now there is this German Germanophobia. I don't think it's true that the Germans are so dominant inside the European Union. But that, this is the perception many people are starting to... It's a bit like it happened in Yugoslavia in the 70s. This idea that had many Croats, that there was a Serbian hegemony in Yugoslavia, that was not so true. So the problem of keeping a balance of power, an internal balance of power of a multinational unity or entity, I think is a very important problem. The other thing is, perhaps I agree with uh, Günther, perhaps the European Union shouldn't be too ambitious. It's an economic unit, it, there is not a European patriotism, and perhaps uh, it should accept uh, that it cannot do certain things. It cannot be a great political power, a great military power. So, for instance, we should accept that we need protection. And also, it's very funny to do this comparison, but I, bit, I think, after all, the European community survived with a political model and relationship that was similar to that at Austria-Hungary after 1879. No? austria hungary had German protection, military protection, and the European community had American protection. And so it's, I think we are, it, it's a bit funny, but it can help to think about problems. And you see that in this way, history is not something dead, but it's something that helps you to understand, to analyze what is the contemporary situation we are living. If I remember well, uh, Georges Clemenceau uh, published uh, the letter of uh, Emperor Charles afterwards, uh, after a public debate with uh, the foreign minister of the Hungary, yeah. uh, Mr. Czerny. Mm -hmm. uh, listening to what you have been saying, I would like to know which letter has been published. Since uh, what are you saying? We need a protection. Uh, the protection isn't there. The actual uh, uh, American president has that okay. there will be no protection, <laughs> and that if you want to have uh, the relations that you have, well, you have to pay. And uh, if one has to pay two percent of his uh, gross national product to be defended by the Americans. The issue is, uh, why should we pay to the Americans? That's the point. Sure. Sure. Okay. So I think let's call it a day. <laughs> Thank you to our guests. First, to all who are, who are, who are present here. And I will give the last word to our to Professor no, Sekir. <laughs> no, you are officially you are yes. you are officially host of the event. I would like to event. thank the Institute of the Serbian Academy of Sciences, the Institute for the Balkan Studies, and I forgot to thank to the French Institute who organized this round table and all those events happening in Belgrade, Novi Sad and Niche. Thank you once more for coming here. Thank you for being so interesting uh, and I enjoyed the discussions. Uh, well, I hope we shall have 
more of these opportunities like this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.